or any other creation, will, when uninhibited, undergo fluid, perpetual change. What we consider commonplace today, such as modern communication and transportation, would have been unimaginable in ancient times. Likewise, the future will contain technologies, realizations, and social structures that we cannot even fathom in the present. We have gone from alchemy to chemistry, from a geocentric universe to a heliocentric, from believing that demons were the cause of illness to modern medicine. This development shows no sign of ending, and it is this awareness that aligns us and leads us on a continuous path to growth and progress. Static, empirical knowledge does not exist. Rather, it is the insight of the emergence of all systems we must recognize. This means we must be open to new information at all times, even if it threatens our current belief system and hence identities. Sadly, society today has failed to recognize this and the established institutions continue to paralyze growth by preserving outdated social structures. Simultaneously, the population suffers from a fear of change, for their conditioning assumes a static identity, and challenging one's belief system usually results in insult and apprehension, for being wrong is erroneously associated with failure. When, in fact, to be proven wrong should be celebrated, for it is elevating someone to a new level of understanding, furthering awareness. The fact is, there is no such thing as a smart human being, for it is merely a matter of time before their ideas are updated, changed, or eradicated. And this tendency to blindly hold on to a belief system, sheltering it from new, possibly transforming information, is nothing less than a form of intellectual materialism. The monetary system perpetuates this materialism not only by its self-preserving structures, but also through the countless number of people who have been conditioned into blindly and thoughtlessly upholding these structures, therefore becoming self-appointed guardians of the status quo. Sheep, which no longer need a sheepdog to control them, for they control each other by ostracizing those who step out of the norm. This tendency to resist change and uphold existing institutions for the sake of identity, comfort, power and profit is completely unsustainable and will only produce further imbalance, fragmentation, distortion and invariably destruction. It's time to change. From hunters and gatherers to the agricultural revolution to the industrial revolution, the pattern is clear. It is time for a new social system which reflects the understandings we have today. The monetary system is a product of a period of time where scarcity was a reality. Now with the age of technology it is no longer relevant to society. Gone with the aberrant behavior it manifests. Likewise, dominant world views such as theistic religion operate with the same social irrelevancy. Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, and all of the others exist as barriers to personal and social growth. For each group perpetuates a closed worldview. And this finite understanding that they acknowledge is simply not possible in an emergent universe. Yet, religion has succeeded in shutting down the awareness of this emergence by instilling the psychological distortion of faith upon its followers where logic and new information is rejected in favor of traditionalized outdated beliefs. The concept of God is really a method of accounting for the nature of things. In the early days people didn't know enough about how things formed, how nature worked, so they invented their own little stories and they made God in their own image. A guy that gets angry. When people don't behave right, he creates floods and earthquakes. And they say it's an act of God. A cursory glance at the suppressed history of religion reveals that even the foundational myths themselves are emergent culminations, developed through influence over time. 
For example, a cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith is the death and resurrection of Christ. This notion is so important that the Bible itself states, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yet it is very difficult to take this account literally, for not only is there no primary source denoting this supernatural event in secular history, awareness of the enormous number of pre-Christian saviors who also died and were resurrected immediately puts the story in mythological territory by association. Early church figures such as Tertullian went to great lengths to break these associations, even claiming that the devil caused the similarities to occur. Stating in the second century, the devil, whose business is to pervert the truth, mimics the exact circumstance of the divine sacraments. He baptizes his believers and promises forgiveness of sins. He celebrates the oblation of bread and brings in the symbol of the resurrection. Let us therefore acknowledge the craftiness of the devil who copied certain things of those that be divine. What is truly sad, however, is that when we cease the idea that the stories from Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and all the others are literal history, and accept them for what they really are, which are purely allegorical expressions derived from many faiths, we see that all religions share a common thread. And it is this unifying imperative that needs to be recognized and appreciated. Religious belief has caused more fragmentation and conflict than any other ideology. Christianity alone has 34,000 different subgroups. The Bible is subject to interpretation. When you read it, you say, I think Jesus meant this. I think Job meant that. Oh no, he meant this. So you have the Lutheran, the Seventh-day Adventist, the Catholic, and a church divided is no church at all. And a church divided is no church at all. And this point on division, which is a trademark of all theistic religions, brings us to our second failure of awareness, the false assumption of separation through the rejection of the symbiotic relationship of life. Apart from the understanding that all natural systems are emergent, where all notions of reality will be constantly developed, altered, and even eradicated, we must also understand that all systems are, in fact, invented fragments, merely for the sake of conversation. For there is no such thing as independence in nature. The whole of nature is a unified system of interdependent variables, each a cause and a reaction, existing only as a concentrated whole. You don't see the plug connected to the environment, so it looks like we're free, wandering around. Take the oxygen away, we all die immediately. Take plant life away, we die. And without the sun, all the plants die, so we are connected. We really must take into account the totality. This isn't just a human experience on this planet. This is a total experience. And we know we can't survive without plants and animals. We know we can't survive without the four elements, you know. And so when are we going to really start taking that into account? That's what it is to be successful. Success depends on how well we relate to everything around us. I'm very aware of the fact that my grandson cannot possibly hope to inherit a sustainable, peaceful, stable, socially just world unless every child today growing up in Ethiopia, in Indonesia, in Bolivia, in Palestine, in Israel also has that same expectation. You've got to take care of the whole community or you're going to have serious problems. And now we have to see that the whole world is the community. And we must all take care of each other that way. And it's not just a community of human beings. It's a community of plants and animals and elements. And we really need to understand that. And that's what's going to bring us joy, too, and pleasure. That's what's missing in our lives right now. We can call